Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's the uh, 5th of October, and we've got some teachers who have been hanging out with us recently, and we don't really know what our topic is yet tonight, but we're going to talk about that and try to figure this out. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, why don't we uh, check in with Monica, and I think if I do that, yeah. We got Valerie Burton with us tonight from New Orleans. We got Gail Desler from oh, Northern California. Um, and Chris Sloan is with us, and Monica Hardy from Colorado. Chris is from Utah. And Scott, uh, you're from Indiana um, as well. <laughs> your last name slipped me there, Scott. What is your last name again? Michelle Hart. Short. Good, and it's uh, my camera's back and forth, which is good. Anyway, a little detail there. Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Monica, why don't you tell us what's been going on with you at the Innovation Lab and your book? And mm -hmm. I notice you have a a longer post about things up on your your blog. But just welcome. How are you? Sorry about good. the delay in getting going here. Um, yeah, we are posting with um, DML Central, and um, that post that you saw was um, kind of the rough draft that we're sending them for our next post, and they had requested just what it was like at the BU house. So it's a post about, it's got some videos so people can see what it's like. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Kids crafted a four-year plan to redefine school a couple of years ago, and we're on year two. Year two has us moving downtown so they can walk to apprenticeships. And um, this amazing man in town has um, given us his house, uh, one of his houses, for a year. So that's what the BU house is. Great. Welcome. And <laughs> cool. Valerie. Let's turn to you a little bit. Um, I'm just going up my screen here just to get something going here. How's your teaching going? How long have you been in classes? And just what's on your mind? Welcome. Valerie, you there? Nope. Okay. We'll keep going up. Scott, oh, maybe she's. Valerie, you here? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, the washing okay. machine was going crazy. <laughs> sorry. That's cool. We can hear a washing machine. So Valerie, what, what, did you, did you hear my question? What question did I miss? I was directing directly to you. I, I was asking how your teaching is going, what your kids are doing, and what you're excited about. What's going on with you right now? Um, I guess I'm trying to be politically correct. Um. You don't have to do that. We're not in a very <laughs> we're not in a very supportive atmosphere right now. So um, teaching is not going that good. Um, I'm not getting much support with the kids, but I'm still eager to provide for them a collaborative environment where they can blog and meet new kids and post their work. So I've had to fight to get computers. But I think I've kind of secured a class set, and I'm hopeful. Is that good? <laughs> Where are you teaching, Valerie, and what are you teaching? I'm teaching English 1 in New Orleans, Louisiana. What and school? I, I, I probably shouldn't say what school now, because oh, okay. I've been too honest. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm hopeful. and I, That's what I can keep saying. I'm hopeful. The kids are um, they're getting excited about meeting other kids and commenting and blogging and posting on Youth Voices. It's just hard getting the equipment and the support I need. But I'm still hopeful. <laughs> you have registered a lot of the kids there. I have. And I, I got to check my settings because I must have done something wrong because not all of my kids can post and comment, uh -huh. but 
I'm trying to work my way through that over the next week or so. And then hopefully next week they'll be able to share some of the work they've been doing. Yeah. It's possible that you didn't make them members, um, but send me an email or I'll send you one with, with what I think is the problem. And, and feel free to call me. I think I sent you an email with my phone number. You did. Thank okay. you. Thank you so, very much, Paul. Well, we can always Thank you very out. much. Gail, why don't you check in? You haven't been on recently. You've been in the chat room recently, but right. what's going on with you and the teachers you're working with? Um, well, I need to get over to Elk Grove High School and help Bob Levine get kids on because I know he definitely wants to get connected. And then I have some elementary teachers, too, you know, who are interested. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I think we're st still kind of... Um, you know, a little bit not sure if it's it's such a good fit for the elementary kids. Mm -hmm. You know, to have them in there with the the secondary. But mm -hmm. anyhow, I want to get Bob Lean uh, set up this week. Cool. Say more what you're thinking about the elementary question. Um, you know, I I'm in a very conservative district, the Elk Grove mm -hmm. School District. So you know, I have to be. Um, that could sort of be the death of, of social media at the elementary levels if, if I got kids getting into stuff that wasn't appropriate for the, you know, the age level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, that, that's kind of something I'm running through in my mind. Um, because I, you know, I think youth, the value of youth voices is it's such a great space for the secondary kids. But I'm just, you know, I'm you know, just, you know, because of some of the posts that have come up, um, I, I would hate for them to feel that they're being restricted in any way because of the elementary kids there. Um, but, you know, I mean, that, that really is something to think about. You know, I, th I think we need to discuss a little bit more. I know Margaret is in there, but, um, you know, and I have a couple teachers definitely interested, but have, and, and I just haven't been able to get with them um, last week or this week. But, um, you know, I, I was just thinking about a couple of years ago, you know, we had the uh, youth radio that mm -hmm. Kevin Hodgson ran right. that was for the elementary kids. Um, I guess we had some, we might have had some middle coming in there too. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm just concerned you know, a little bit, you know, that it could be a two-way, I don't want, I don't want it to be a res I don't want the elementary presence to be restrictions for the secondary kids, but I also have to have some concerns for, um, you know, if we have administrators or parents, et cetera, if they happen to, you know, wander in there and head into the secondary and see something that they don't think is appropriate, that could be an issue. Mm -hmm. I'd like to keep talking about this if we could. Is yeah. That, I mean, yeah. this is a good topic. Yeah. Uh, Monica, do you, I mean, you know, do you have a way to ask us questions about that and help us think about it? <laughs> that... Well, since you asked, um, <laughs> I think it's a shame that that's, that's where we're at. Those kids are going to have those conversations in places. Um, I think that's part of um, our role as, in public education, just as a role as a parent, um, to have them experience those conversations in a place where they're around us. You know, um, thinking that it's not going to happen just because we're, you know, guarding against it. And I completely understand what all you're saying. I know what everyone is up against. I'm just stating the, my belief that I think it's a shame that that's how we fly. Well, and I also recognize, um, you know, to have a high school kid come in and comment to an elementary kid. I mean, it's such an amazing mentorship, um, you know, and. Because, you know, for a for a sixth grader, a twelfth grader, you know, or ten, even a ninth grader is, um, you know, way, they look up to them, obviously. I think, I think the risk in not doing it is much greater than the risk in doing it. I think, um, you know, we keep saying we want to raise the standards when we're raising the wrong standards and we're not letting people be in spaces where they can raise standards that matter. And I think this might potentially be one space. 
So that's my opinion. Yeah, well, I think it's you know a really worthy conversation. Um, so, you know, oh, it's it, wait, it's is, very. It's very so now, tenuous as well because yeah. I, you know, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, I'm not. It's a tough one. I just saw Valerie come on with her camera. Yeah, so yeah, she's working like, on it. Looks like I'm. Looks like I'm the only person who. I am. I'm, not, I'm trying to work with it. <laughs> I'm the only one who did not get on with a camera. Hmm. That's a challenge, <laughs> I guess. So, and Chris Sloan, maybe you could help with this a little bit. But one of the things that I love about Youth Voices and that I wouldn't want to give up, and Gail, I think you're saying the same thing, but students are encouraged to explore subjects that sometimes aren't normally explored in school. Exactly, and, right. and, uh, and that's really important. Uh-huh. Um, and, Paul, what, what I'm – seeing more of now is that, you know, if you just look at the discussions on uh, Youth Voices, there's a nice mix of different schools coming in now, so it's not um, like a big block of my stuff, which sometimes happens, my student stuff, um, but uh, a lot of different voices I'm seeing, um, and uh, yeah, I got distracted by one of the posts. They're looking good, um, but what I started doing was trying to, uh, at least for the time being, um, until Bill kind of tidies up some of the stuff, um, I said to them, can we pick certain days of the week and then you guys just post on those days? Because um, in the classroom when I had students um, all get onto the site at the same time through our laptop cart and through that little airport, things were getting um, you know, pretty sluggish on the site, so I decided to kind of distribute things a little bit. So they're okay with, there'll be like a few people posting every night uh, for the foreseeable future. You're talking about the slow And problem. so I guess, yeah, because some of my thing was like, um, you know, if it gets to the point where uh, it's too slow, then they, uh, you know, the usability kind of impedes. The thing I'm doing is just, starting class with some of the most recent posts and just having the students talk about their writing that way. Hmm. Can you say more? What's that Which I, like? Well, um, so what I do in photography a lot of times is I will start the class just with my the Flickr stream from the group and um, we'll just talk about their photography and uh, that has been really a, a real motivating, powerful thing for them because more so than last year or the years before every day there's something new there and so there's something about getting your stuff up there and you know I, I can project on a whiteboard um, seeing their stuff and then having people talk about it that seems to make it more valuable to the group and also um, I can bring a lot of the teaching points you know about photography into it, and so I would say that the photography has gotten with the writing now. Uh, is if a few of them post every day, then I could start the class with some of those posts and just have people, you know, they could read it out loud, and we could talk about it from a you know sentence level kind of thing, or we could just talk about the ideas. Um, but I think starting with their writing and bringing that more prominently into the curriculum. I think it's going to have the same effect on their writing, so we'll see. So you start with posts I was listening. by kids in the room. Sorry, Monica. No, that's fine. What was that? I was asking Tell when you. you're projecting a post, it's the kid. It's it's a, a discussion post created by somebody who's in the room at the time. Um, well, if it's like photography, actually, sometimes it's, I have two classes of photography, and so sometimes I talk about the other classes' photography, okay. but, you know, when the students talk most is when they talk about the people who are in that room, and so I imagine most of the talking is going to be from the people who are in that room, if it's like photography, which I'm thinking it will. But anyway, I'm just saying... What did you want to ask or say? I was just going to... Um... I've been trying to catch some of Jeff Lebo's, you know, hangout sessions, and mm -hmm. um, 
I think Stephen Downs, I don't remember the lady's name, but she's on several of them. Um, they were talking about writing and um, how we think that's the only form, that writing is the only form of writing, you know, mm -hmm. and encouraging conversation and encouraging video and, in your case here, photography communicate. Um, not yeah, that I, I think um, I talk about the word composition a lot. Uh, because, like, you know, literally you can compose a shot in photography or, or a frame in video, but also, you know, it's composition, which is writing. And, and I noticed that, the, at least in my own mind, and I think in some of the student media uh, creators, um, like when you talk about transitions, literally, or a separate media class who are also in um, English, kind of interesting to see how their compositions kind of progress. And I know I'm in a unique situation, um, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say the things that are I'm benefiting from it. Um, I think because we separate, you know, disciplines so much, we have a tendency not to zoom out and think metaphorically and think in fractals. And there's so much benefit to whichever realm the kid connects to communicating. And what you just said, if if, they, if we can let that be their entry point then yeah, they're going to see, writing's going to be so much easier for them. You know, if they've, if they've talked about those things like you're saying about a video, you know, um, they're going to want to write more. Um, and then they're going to know those elements of writing. I, I, just, I just feel we've missed out on that with our um, focused curriculum and, and, you know, separating into different disciplines. But I love to. I love that you're talking about that. I think that's great. And I can follow with the story that I, you know, spent whatever extra time I had over the last few days, making sure that um, Audacity is on every computer, and there's a there's a headset on every computer, and that there's a microphone on every computer. So now, so now my kids have the option to either talk what they want to say or to write it. Um, That's super. You know, What's Audacity? Audacity is just a, I mean, it's not just, it's a wonderful editing, but also recording program. Um, so how do they talk? Do, so there's no video, they're talking? Yeah, there's no video. I don't have webcams on the camera. But, you know, we all it, need to, it does something We all need to write Google you. and hang out and say we need to lower the age just a bit. Yeah. But I actually like audio to them, um, but I, you know, I agree with the other. Um, can I play one? Let let me try to play one if I can, and because it'll get back to Gail's issue of appropriateness too. <laughs> and Gail was uh, just about to say something, Paul. Let's yeah, see go if ahead. Do that. While, while I love I'm I love this I love Audacity. It's free and it's cross platform too. So, and it's been there for a long time, and you know it's. Mm -hmm. I but really it, like it. Its main purpose is to record. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, but it makes it so easy for kids to edit, and and then when they see how easy it is to take out an er or an um or a cough or anything, they get um, you know. Well, also you know our EL kids too. They'll they see the sound waves, so visually they get what you're talking about. About you know maybe you could be a little more expressive okay. in that reading. Great. Great. And I would say more. More than editing the Oz and so forth, it yeah, it just makes it easy to delete something and go back and start again, kind of thing. But yeah, yeah. And I guess or, same point. But not have to delete the whole dang thing, you know, just just tell right. what you don't right. want. Right. Um. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I had this young man, um, Javon, um, and I think that's on the screen. Is that on the screen for everybody? Does everyone see yes. why, do, why people do people fight? fight? Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was putting it up already, but anyway, so it's there. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but I'll tell the quick story. You know, Javon is a young man. It turns out he's 19 years old. Um, he's He wasn't in class the first few, uh, first several days. And when he started coming, he would just sit, 
in the back of the class and I wasn't even sure who he was or he was on my role. Okay. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is Javon. Um, I eventually figured out who he was and he was in my class. Um, and I got him to come up with like, you know, first thing I work with is what, what kind of questions, what, what do you want to think about in this class? So, he came up with the question, why do people fight? Which I think is a pretty good question. But yeah, I imagine that a 19 year old is going to talk about that differently than a, somebody in third grade. But I do want to push the point that with G or Gail and ask, um, like even though a 19 year old's perspective from the South Bronx perspective on why do people fight is going to be different than a third graders somewhere else. I kind of think they can get it. And I, on my side, I like working with Javon and making clear to him that he's got to be appropriate in how he talks about things. But well, it's certainly a yeah. universal question too. Yeah, I think so. Let me, Let's see if it works if I play it. Just because of how I have my audio set up, I think you'll be able to hear it. If you can't, let me know. Hi, my name is Javon Carter. Is that working? I'm 19 yeah. years old. And I attend Bronx Academy High School. I say people fight because... Oh, my topic is why do people fight? I say people fight because of aggravation, stress, and being annoyed. These are three normal reasons for one to fight. I usually fight over money, and I usually fight over money and aggravating situations. And people fight because stress and what's going on, by, and what's going on, they, <laughs> what's going on in their background. People fight because of their parents, and their parents not feeding them, and they gotta take care of their own. So I got something out of Javon. He, uh, he came mm -hmm. back after school because he, he wanted to know if anybody had responded to him yet. Um, oh, gosh. So that's so important. Paul, can you talk about how you got that? Uh, you know, like what, how does that look in the classroom? And um, well, let's, how about that first? Well, first of all, everybody's doing something different. Like the, the there's a girl who was working um, on creating an icon, so she's doing that. Other kids are responding to each other, so I'm able to kind of get around and sit down with him. And and then once he got started, he thought he could talk for a very long time about the topic, but he found that he got you know after a minute and a half, he didn't have much else to say yet, <laughs> which is a good thing. And he wanted to kind of get rid of it, but I showed him quickly how to export it uh, as an MP3, and then within three minutes it was on the site. Um, so, so that speed I think was really important in, in being. You know, he didn't. He was. We were able to value that little minute and a half thing he did. Um, but I'm. So, did that answer some of the question? Well, yeah, like, did he? Did he write that, or is it all extemporaneous? So was he, he had, reading it? Is that what you mean? Yeah. I'm going to be different with different kids on that. He had written a sentence, and I suggested he could start with that sentence. Um, but then I wanted him to go much further than that, if he could. So I'm hoping he'll come in, hear what he did, and then think, you know, oh, I could compose this, I could create this in a different way. And I think the writing and the the reading will go back and forth in lots of ways. I mean, Chris, we, you and I, we did this when the, it was much harder to do in the past. And I think mm -hmm. what we found is that kids who would read a post, and I, I'll start that way with a lot of kids, then think about the writing in a different way. They think about, oh, if I'm going to have to read this, I'm going to, or if I have the opportunity to read it, I'm going to, I'm going to have to write it differently. So that back and forth, mm -hmm. I think is, is interesting and important. Monica, you were trying to get in there, I think. Did you want to? No. Oh, okay. I was just saying that was, that was helpful. I appreciate you sharing that. Hmm. 
Well, my guess is, you know, that when he hears that, um, the more he listens back to it or he gets feedback from people, you know, I think his, his voice becomes stronger. You can, you can sense in there that he's got some powerful feelings, but, you know, he speaks kind of haltingly. Um, but I would guess that his voice is going to become much stronger, you know, very quickly. That's one thing we're really experiencing um, with the detox booth this year. Last year, the detox is the process of learning to learn. It's what we're doing for our research. Um, can we monitor growth of this process of learning to learn? Last year, we used a Google Doc, um, which some really liked, but it wasn't like really resonating. This year, we're using a detox booth where they go in and there's a laptop. Um, and so they can watch themselves as they're talking. Um, it can be private if they want. Just the researchers will see it or we'll put it on YouTube. But the one thing that we're seeing is, you know, your watch, it's just like, I i don't know if I've talked about it with you guys, but I'm a, a swimmer and in the 70s or 60s or whenever a video camera came out and my coach could tell me over and over what to do, but until he videoed it and I got to see it, and we're we're seeing that same thing with them watching themselves talk, you know, and it's just really improving their ability to speak and um, how they come across. And we didn't think it was going to be that huge, but the fact that they're looking at themselves in the you know the MacBooks just open and they're they're watching themselves talk as well. So I think that's huge. I I really liked that. I'm glad you shared that, Paul. And I was thinking about detox when I set this up for them. Again, the the idea is that when you sit down at a computer, you know, if if I had if I had webcams on every camera, we'd try to do it too. But so I'm wondering, can you suggest what kinds of things you ask them to do when you ask them to detox? I mean, I've read it in the book, but just to remind us again, like, are they just talking about? Go ahead. Here's detox. Here's the main focus. Um, what we're the main focus of what we're trying to do is get away from the prescribed um, mm -hmm. curriculum, the prescribed learning, the publicly prescribed learning that we have, and towards a process of learning to learn. Well, we're feeling like key to true intellectual learning is reflection, self-reflection, rather than comparing yourself to other people on its you know stat static content at a given time. So the detox, especially this year, because it's really a dialogue, we, we went back and forth about should a person be back there, you know? So it's really a, a more natural conversation. But then we decided, no, statistically, that's not good because depending on the person that's back there, they're going to respond differently. So now it's, it's really the person. It's just them. And so our focus is if we want to get better at learning, what we've been missing, a lot of us, is that moment of self-reflection. And if we could just encourage people to self-reflect more. Well, detox is, um, there's five parts to it. Be, to rid your mind of the chatter of who you really are. Um, to notice the unlikely. Um, to dream boldly. To connect to people and information and to do what matters. And so when they go into the room, and they can do this from any computer, but I think most of them are going to start going into the room because it's so convenient. Just on the, it's, un, it's under a stairwell, and so the stairs, there's five stair, stairs, and so we've got, um, what have you been, how convenient. have you been being? I don't remember that question, but what did you, what have you noticed? Um, what have you dreamed about? What have you? It's just got those key words because those are going to be the words we extrapolate with the word doc, word um, recognition that we want to do. So just, you know, even if you just ask the question, what have you noticed lately? I mean, that's huge. Mm -hmm. I could so there's the, the short question. answer to your question. What if, no, if you just said, here's a computer, go to it whenever you want, or use your own and email it to me, but go to it whenever you want and, and just ask yourself, what, what, have, what have I noticed lately? It, like Christian was in there for 10 minutes the other day. Last year he would go in there for, I mean, he would talk about things for like maybe a minute. And that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's progress. That's, he's growing in his ability to self-reflect, which is huge to intellectual learning. Just because I need things repeated, could you repeat the five questions again? I, and I hear what you're saying that it's not necessarily that you have to do all five of those. It's about right, reflecting. Right. 
But yeah, still, it's what it, you you could yeah. do all five. You could. We mostly do the notice, dream, connect, do. Those were the first that we came up with. Notice the unlikely, dream boldly, connect to people and information, and do what matters most. But then um, Jim, Jim Folks did the, um, the professor at Colorado State University that's heading up the research, and I were sitting down one day last year, and he was like, we're missing something here. And he was like, we're missing the B. You've got to rid your mind of all the chatter, you know, of who, who you really are, because most of us are other people. Um, so it's be, notice, dream, connect, do. Nice. And it would be cool if, I mean, you know, if we did that too, even if we're not videotaping. And I just gave kids an opportunity to kind of jump in and do that kind of reflection whenever. Well, you know what's really cool? We are calling out in all of our stuff for anybody to send that in because if you've seen Deb Roy's TED Talk on the birth of a word, that's the kind of technology um, that we want to use, and even more so today with um, the death of Steve Jobs. I mean, if, if, if we want to mourn his loss, that's one thing, but if we want to carry on his, his gift to us, um, I would suggest we use technology more for things that make us more humane. And so this is one way. Um, we've got over 800 videos now, and if we call in from videos all over the place, technology can handle that. If, if you don't believe it, watch Deb Roy's talk. Um, it, so that would be great, Paul. Um, but I also would highly recommend, I, I can't tell you how much it's, it's helped me and it's changed me to do it myself. And it's helped the kids to do it more because they're watching me do it, you know. Cool. It's really helpful. Fred Midland has joined us. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm without my headphones right now. I hope you can hear me okay. Sounds great. There's no reverb. Good. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Fred, what's going on with you? Welcome. <laughs> you can Well, thanks. Um I'm in the middle of just the very first steps of three different projects. Um one that I'm really excited about is a collaboration with the Museum of Art and History in Santa Cruz, which has a new, really dynamic director. Um, and she's just started this last May, I believe, May or June, and had spent the previous two years traveling all over the world to helping museums design and develop interactive exhibits. And um, so I met with her and pitched her this idea that I got off of a, uh, a, a museum blog where a group of middle school students came into this museum and researched some objects in the museum and then wrote Wikipedia articles about them. So it was a very much a real world task and a, a, a regular adult level contribution of knowledge, um, which I felt was just absolutely the kind of authentic learning experience that I've been looking for. So I met with their um, collections manager. They, they don't even have an official archivist um, at the museum anymore. They used to, but uh, she was very excited about this idea. Her first thought was, well, we have a huge collection of postcards. And that seemed like something that could be an, an interesting kind of research um, project in the sense that you, with uh, a local history bank of images that deep, we could get into scanning and researching both the images themselves and the photographers or creators of the images and see if there's anybody around to interview and so on. But then she suggested they also have a whole collection of unknowns, of actual physical stuff that they're not sure exactly what it is. So um, my next step is to enlist the group of middle school students who will be the students of teachers that I'm, um, that I'm going to be doing some digital storytelling workshops with and see if I can get those teachers and their students interested in pursuing uh, one of these ideas. She liked the 
the unknown object idea even better than the postcards. Um, yeah, so have that's, you guys? That's the one I want to focus on. I've heard of a story, and maybe you guys can help, but I think someone made up that there were unknowns in some kind of a library or museum, and people went crazy. I mean, that is a great, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I wish I could remember it. Does anybody, does that ring uh -huh. a bell with anyone? Well, the, it, what it makes me think of is the, the uh, Banksy, the um, street artist, made his name uh, internationally when he successfully shuffled in some pieces to the British Museum. He just walked in, stuck it to the wall, and they stayed there for weeks before anybody <laughs> noticed that they weren't actually part of the collection. I don't think that's the same story, but it made no, me think of that. No, it's not. Someone, someone made up, they were making up a story that they needed help with what, what you just said, that there were some unknowns and they needed help figuring it out. Um, but just the fact that, you, that what he did, you know, that's what we're trying to do in our house is, is every day something different is there so that peop when people leave the house, they're always like, dang, I had to really think in that house. I mean, things are, we're not used to things being different. We're used to things being the same. Um, I hate to take up so much time, but there's one more little, um, a girl that's in the lab, she's, she's going every day to a kindergarten class because last year she said she really is very curious about how we learn. And so we asked her just yesterday she? if she were to be able to create an atmosphere for kids. Because she's in a situation where she's with an incredible teacher, but it's, you know, it's, they have a routine. And she said that she would have a different space all the time because of that very thing that we just get so used to mm -hmm. how things are. That um, So I think kids would be very intrigued with, oh, they don't even know, you know. Right. Right. That's a great idea. That observation about the physical space being different makes me think about something I've always wanted to investigate anthropologically, the way in which in uh, like conferences or meetings where there are several sessions, it's almost universally in my experience, people will pick a chair or a spot and the next day they come back to that same spot and they're disconcerted and, and uncomfortable if somebody has taken over their spot. This is a, you know, a brand new public space. And there is no ownership here. Why, how do we get so attached so quickly to some little um, piece of our physical environment? So, Fred, exactly. what's, what's your next step with that project? with the museum project? I have to coordinate with the, uh, the site administrator and the teachers about getting these um, trainings moving and figure out exactly where to slot in getting the kids from the school over to the museum, which is close enough to walk, but still, you know, it's a field trip process and all of that. So it'll be a couple of months before there's m much in the way to, to really report, I think. Walk, um, Fred, walk. Walking is so good. Walk. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I just did a project last year are. where I took uh, second graders a mile and a half to a museum where we did a string figure installation, and everybody said I was crazy. You can't make sixth grade, second graders walk a mile and a half each way. They loved it. I didn't have a single person complain even. Well, talk about spaces that are different. Out. I mean, if you walk a mile and a half, you're bound to notice something that you haven't seen before. So that's, right. that's the new part. <laughs> Fred, briefly, what are the other two projects you said? You're well, I'm sorry I was so late. Uh, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> So the other two projects I'm doing, I, I have another collaboration going with um, that's a little further along with the Renaissance High School Continuation School group um, because they're, again, the teachers that I'm working with are still getting up to speed um, with what is going to actually go into the curriculum with them. So I decided I needed to do something on my own. So I created a community service project 
in a collaboration again with the Museum of Art and History, they're doing community events where they have artists and artisans demonstrate things like they're calling it Maker at the Ma. The Ma, M-A-H, Museum of Art and History is how people refer to the museum. So they've had this series of events and they're planning one that's going to be a, an open community event with lots of little booths. So I volunteered to create a group of Renaissance High students who will come and teach string games to the, the kids and any adults who are interested who come to this event. That'll be November 18th. And we've had two meetings so far of me starting to teach the kids string games so they can then teach them um, to whoever comes. Should I know what string games are? Uh, Cat's Cradle, um, Jacob's Ladder, the... Okay, you know, okay, thanks. Yeah, I do. Right. Great. And then where, but where's yeah. it go after that? Where does it go after that? Uh, the idea is, in terms of a shareable product from that is the reflections that the kids have on the whole process of learning something that they didn't know and then learning how to teach it and then teaching it and what, do, what, what was the most challenging in all of those steps. It actually gave me an idea um, for this um, uh, uh, the, the MacArthur um, Mozilla digital badges competition that's up, and I was so, thinking about I I I don't know if yeah, people are that. familiar with that. It's, it's a whole yeah, other topic. Yeah, tell us what your idea is. Well, the idea, you know, I I had a lot of trouble with the whole badges. Um, you know, the, I've never I never was a scout. I never did merit badges. I don't know anything about it. I've always been a little um, leery of competition because I'm always trying to foster collaboration and cooperation instead. And it just feels, oh, I'm going to earn this badge. It's like I don't know. It's something about it that never felt right to me. So. I talked to a friend of mine who was an Eagle Scout and did lots of badges and he said what he remembers about the whole experience as being valuable was that was how they got their parents to take them places and do things out in nature. Um, it was the social part of it, the relating to the other kids and the, the, the actual outdoor excursions that were what really mattered. So the idea in relation to these digital badges would be that, yeah, you create a series of badges, but what, what the, the earning the badge is not just showing I know how to do this or that skill, but then, okay, why? What is the purpose of learning that skill, showing that you know it? What good can you do with it? So that's the next level. And then now show a group of real people that you're in the same room with and or online with in real uh, time how you did that whatever that interesting worthwhile thing that getting this skill enables you to do and that's your next level is the presentation and then the reflection on the whole process is yet another level of badged them <laughs> or whatever so that that's what I've been toying with here's here's where it comes from Mozilla as part of their open source development effort have created a a, a whole API for um, creating digital badges so that a web designer can put up a badge saying I did the uh, PHP certification. It's essentially like the you know big company certifications, but it's all being done in an open source, open source, open learning environment where all the resources for anybody to accomplish any of it is supposed to be there for free, for and and online and accessible. So this is a grant proposal that. Um, MacArthur has put out in collaboration with Mozilla to adapt that model to student learning. 
so you create your, your there's three levels of of the uh, of the project one is and I, I still don't understand exactly the difference between these first two one is designing the actual badges then the other is I, I guess designing the coursework yeah. for getting the badges and then there's a third level of researching how effective is all of this and you can do a, a, any one of those or all three that's all um, worth looking at so it would be uh, uh, yeah. so here's here's my yeah. thing about that Fred have have you guys right. um, read Clay Shirky's um, cognitive surplus the story is probably elsewhere but the story about the daycare centers in Israel um, yeah, tell us. Yeah. there's 10 daycare centers and uh, there's a late fee if you pick up there's no late fee if you pick up your kid late um, and not very many people are late and then they impose a late fee on about seven of them and it, it equals about three dollars worth if you pick up your kid ten minutes past ten minutes late you pay this three dollars well right. the pickup increased and then they take away the fee and it stays up there and this whole idea of this culture of trust and now now people are no long you're no longer imposing on people because it's a marketing deal you know and I just have a trouble with um, Krishna Murti wrote a book about the significance of light and in it he said that um, partial freedom is no freedom and I feel the same way about badges I mean we can talk about it ideally but when it plays out here's an example Sal Khan um, when when Gates got a hold of him which is great I mean Gates is trying to help as much as he can but now they're talking about kids who now that the badges are in place kids are even admitting that they're doing it for the badges you know so I just right. and then Dan Pink talking about the, the carrot and the stick and I just I don't know if we're going over you know we're trying to make oh, these well, I, absolutely that's where that's what I started with that's what I'm saying is my basic objection to the whole thing and it goes back even further than that it's to the the basic idea that that competition is in any way effective as a motivator I, it cooperation is actual it, there's a, a wonderful discussion by um, David Graeber this economist who just published a, a wonderful sounding book I haven't read it I've just heard him interviewed about it several times called debt the first five thousand years who, who one of his lines that I love is capitalism is really just a bad way to organize the underlying communism of daily life that is when there is no such thing as an original barter what there is originally is is the cooperation that everybody needs to to get along with everybody else that's you don't go and calculate oh if I loan my hammer to my neighbor then he's gonna owe me for uh, uh, only that level of tool and and what if I wanted to borrow a more expensive tool from him he wouldn't lend I mean it just it's craziness it is not the way the world works and, so Fred, Fred and join us and try to try to submit our, one try to submit one to Mozilla without my, the badges yeah let's rebel it up well that's the whole uh, Exactly. That's that's what I'm hoping that a discussion like this and and processes like this can come up with as a way to sort of transcend and finesse the whole um, yeah. framework. I I like even so better been... in terms of those examples is that the uh, the experiments with kids who uh, were given um, room full of toys to play with and uh, told that they would be rewarded in some way for so, some kind of behavior some of them were and in in other situations they weren't the 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 more rewards there were the less interested the kids were in any of it the more it was just stuff there that they could do what they want with the more interested they were so Fred uh, and everybody, I, I, one of the things we were doing on this show, I think, is uh, searching out some topics that we want to talk about more. So certainly the gamification of education and badges and all of that stuff, I think, would be worth working on more uh, um, on another show. 
I, I wanted to get Valerie, who got her uh, her video working, to say hello. Valerie, are you there? And can you say what you were saying about kids see badges as swag? Or I don't say what you were, said there in the yeah, chat. Yeah, I'm here. There you go. Hi. Yeah. Hi. So I've got a lot of inner city kids. So for them, it's almost, although I disagree with paying kids for classwork, they see the badges as a way of being able to brag that they've done something or they've posted something or they've done something that's worth other people looking at. So the badges are a way for them to be able to brag. Um, I've had for my blog a couple of years ago, I created a couple of badges that I, I give to the kids. If you've posted, you know, three or four posts or you've done whatever, I give you a bag, a badge for being a, a, a Burton Scholars poster, blogger, whatever. So for some kids, they need that sort of swag or motivation for them to continue to work. Um, and it's like when you it's, call it, it, it really is like a payment. When you call it swag, what, what what's the implication of that? All right, again, inner city kids. Yeah. So swag for them, swag for them is when you're able to walk with pride because you've done something or you're wearing something that, and you're doing it well. So for them, for them, for me to be able to say. You're not just doing your classwork, you're doing it well. Uh, for a lot of them, those badges are that swag for them to be able to brag about. And I'd agree, Valerie. In, in the publicly prescribed schools that we have, we do need things like that. It, we're not going to get there unless we get rid of that publicly prescribed, you know, and let kids follow their passion. So. That's great that that's working for you. Thank you so much for making me realize the the, the uh, relation between swag and swagger. I I never made that association <laughs> right. before. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad my kids could teach you something. I'll let them know tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> So, so by any means necessary, I try to get them to do work. Valerie, you said you're having a hard time getting the things that you need. What What do you have? Um, <laughs> we're having a lot of problems. Um, we're having a lot of discipline problems. I'm having a lot of problems getting the equipment I need. Like what, um, what equipment do you have right now, Valerie? Luckily, I've got faculty members who understand that for me, being online is essential for my curriculum. So they have donated their laptops or their desktops or whatever. So I'm borrowing a class set of netbooks, but I have to give it back in a couple of days. But I've got teachers who give me desktops. So I think I've got like seven desktops in my classroom that would and be sitting, I might have secured. That would be sitting and ahead, doing Paul. nothing, right, in their classroom. I'm sorry, do it again, Paul? I'm just sorry. Those computers would be sitting and doing nothing in their classrooms? That's the teacher's? Well, class? they they yeah. might be utilizing them, but they wouldn't be utilizing them every day. Like they know I would utilize them every day. Mm -hmm. Valerie, any of your kids have? Um, cell phones? We're a no cell phone community at my school. I get that, but do any of your kids have cell phones? All of them have them. And I've already got written up twice <laughs> for allowing them to use the cell phones in the classroom. And, and you know, yeah, what can you do? That's one thing that we're working on, though, um, Valerie, uh, globally. So just know that you're not alone and, and people are working on creating more spaces of permission because um, that would solve a lot of your problems right there. It would. If they have those and um, 
the access that you're talking about and the, the connections you want them to make. How many of them have cell phones that have um, connection? They're not just phones. Okay. 95%. The kids will sit in class with the cell phones under their desk and tell me that they can post to their blog. Oh, cough. Using their hey, cell phone. Do you do you want to send us or send me um, names of people in your district? <laughs> I'd be happy to <laughs> visit with them. <laughs> I will, my, I will my, do that. I'm fighting. My principal said that uh, he had a realization when he sat with a young person and said, what's more important to you, getting your phone back or getting your diploma? And the kid said, my phone. Yeah. <laughs> but, because what yeah. does the phone represent? <laughs> you guys, it's yeah. so different than, yeah. I see over the course of the last 20 years I've been in education, kids are happier. Even though to me they're even more restricted because the curriculum is even more bound and not as helpful to them in their future. Um, they're, they're happier. Because that phone represents connection. You know, they're not right. going in these spaces all by themselves. They can endure a lot more because they're not going there alone. Right. So I, I, I watched a Facebook conversation the other day and blew me away because it started out these two guys going to battle. And I'm like, what? T take it home. Don't put it up here on Facebook. You know, it's like, this is ridiculous. But watched it and they actually worked it out. You could tell it was a legit working out a, a thing on Facebook and we're taking those that's how they communicate and we're taking those away from them and I know you know this but yeah give me some names come on 95% <laughs> what are we thinking I don't I have no idea I really don't I really don't okay For them well, we're, to be we're behind you we're working on it you know, <laughs> thank you and just to bring up but a similar but issue is that YouTube is on in my school and it's not on in a lot of schools so not I've had to, yeah uh, so I've had to figure but so on the other side of it I've had to figure out how to get their attention at times you know right. and or how to figure out you guys walks walks yeah, are great you go away from the school they pull out their phone they go to YouTube they do their stuff you mm -hmm. come back <laughs> walk <laughs> <laughs> so so I just wanted to recap and then um, Monica maybe you and I and Chris could get together between shows here and kind of figure out some themes over the next few shows um, and certainly dealing with um, mobile devices and how those are dealt with positively in lots of different situations would be an interesting thing to talk about I think um, and if I'm others not, have heard themes here, go ahead. What? I was just going to say, I, I would really like it f us to phrase it as hmm. dealing with kids' connections, because we right. we all say dealing with mobile devices and everyone's right. eyes roll. You know, it's like we got to rephrase what we're talking about here, because it's 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 a bigger issue than that we're dealing with something the kids are bringing in that we don't want them to bring in. But anyway, yeah. That's good. I like that rephrasing that's great so Paul um, do you have any closing thoughts I yeah How's I'm, I'm trying to get the I know we're getting time but but getting back to badges and thinking about that mm -hmm. um, I'm watching I'm watching in my own school I'm watching a program that's done by new visions that's teaching kids social networking and they get badges for going on and doing certain things online and I'm like oh my gosh anyway I, I have lots of thoughts about that <laughs> But then I wonder, am I doing the same thing? You know, so it's all kind we, of we really all are. interesting. Yeah. To, yeah. yeah. I think we so, all are. I think it's so hard for us to see that. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. It's so ingrained in us. Um, but that's the only way we're going to get to the brilliance inside each kid is if we get rid of that. Yeah. I think so. And, and yeah. so I think that would be a great thing to look at. Sorry, Valerie, do you want to say something? No, I was just saying we have to work our way through the um, playing with the device, learning the devices, and then you find out the brilliance in you know them that 
when they use the devices. And then, and then maybe there are some connections here, but I still don't want to give up on Gail's question. And, and I'm really happy that Margaret Simon down in Louisiana is, uh, is going to stay on youth voices no matter what, <laughs> but, but certainly thinking about how to have conversations on a site that are appropriate to lots of different levels of kids. And that's cuts in lots of different ways. Cause I think it is also true that teachers can help second and third graders understand what a 19 year old is talking about. But just to bring up you know, crazy to bring it up here at the end, but I, I know one of my students wrote about regretting that she had had sex before she was married. And then Chris Sloan's uh, student replied and said, uh, you know, don't be so uptight, you know, be more open. <laughs> in some. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to prevent um, high school kids from having that conversation. But if you look at what's actually there, I don't think it's inappropriate at all for a second or third grader to understand that, you know, here's here are teenagers having this conversation. So I think there might be some learning moments there. But I think we need to think about how that works in the community. And I think it's complicated. So that I'd love to talk about that more. And we should be finishing here. So that's my last thoughts. Anybody else? Well, that, Monica, that brings up, I don't know if anybody else uh, uh, picked up on and read the uh, recent several different pieces, but all with the same point by Dana Boyd about cyberbullying. And the, the, basically she's saying that there isn't any current um, program claiming to address cyberbullying that actually gets the way kids really are thinking about the, the issue and that so, it's a whole discussion but I it, it would be a, I think it relates to some of these issues that we've just been talking about and we could have Dana on yeah. that'd be great to do yeah sounds good Chris any last thoughts <laughs> we're way over time <laughs> Many, many Sorry. last thoughts, but uh, you know, you're uh, just the one that I would share is, um, Paul, we go back and forth about the the benefits or the charm of the one-room schoolhouse and what we lost in that, and I think that, you know, a lot of what you're talking about is the kind of school that my dad went to, and that is, you know, you do have older kids in the room with the younger kids, and you work it out, so mm -hmm. I think there's no problem with having the young kids with the old kids because I have young kids and old kids in the house all the time anyway and it seems to work out well so uh, yeah that's my final thought is it's kind of the one room schoolhouse but you teach the old kids and you're not going to get in trouble when there are mistakes so yeah it's just no I think I think the, I share you know, responsibility I, I agree yeah absolutely Fair enough. Um, how do we draw this to a close? Monica, do you uh, have any thoughts? And who's our unless, our guest next week? Do you want to say um, a little bit about her? I hope it's going sure. to work out. Um, Catherine Von Jan, I think is how you say her last name. And she started Rad Matter, um, which Dale Stevens has picked up. Um, it's pretty amazing. It fits in with the, the Kids for Your Plan, where 12 plus is a quasi career. And, you know, for years there's been um, you know, CEOs paying kids to go to universities. Um, they call you, them incubation centers in the university. Um, so this is a way to, to branch that out even more. So um, we had met last year at Providence and actually sat with her. Uh, we got really close and sat with her trying to come up with a name for this. Didn't realize it was Rad Matter. Met up with Dale Stevens this last year was really interested in this rad matter thing he kept talking about, saw Dale and Catherine standing together at Providence and said, oh, you guys know each other. And they're like, we're doing rad matter. And so that pretty much blew me away. So she'll be here. Um, she's part of the book now. Um, so that'll be great. And what I'd like to close with is um, 
um, Steve Jobs um, a, a quote from his 2005 uh, graduation um, that your time is limited and so don't waste it um, living someone else's life and then he says stay hungry and stay foolish um, so that's how I'd like Great. to end it thank you um, and I, we're just gonna have to end here um, but I, but I love that this show has prompted us to think about lots of things to think about um, and to continue talking about in future shows. And we should get that all kind of maybe a little bit organized, but maybe not too. We'll see. Maybe um, not. Yeah, maybe not. That's okay. I agree. Um, but, you know, organizing in that, like inviting Dana Boyd and some other people onto the show with us would be a great thing to do. So I think thinking about Hold that. Hold on now, Paul, you can really get Dana Boyd? Sure. Why not? Do it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm dying yeah, to talk to Dana Boyd. She's okay. like amazing. She goes where the people are. I love it. Yeah. So, um, and you know what? We want to say here at the end of the, that uh, we've been broadcasting <laughs> um, over EdTechTalk dot com and worldbridges.net and we want to thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo for giving us the courage to call people up like Dana Boyd and say we want to talk to you <laughs> um, seriously that's what this is all about so um, exactly. thank you all for exactly. your thoughts and thanks, uh, Paul. good to talk to you all good night thanks you guys night good night thanks <laughs>